Hi there. We want to continue from where we ended in the last uh, presentation. In the last presentation, we looked at um, the different activities that are involved in the traditional systems development life cycle, commonly known as the waterfall model. And we started with the elicitation of um, requirements and we moved on through uh, what happens during design. Okay, you start with architectural design and then um, you move on to detailed design wherein your focus is on the individual components uh, that make up your system. Okay, you design them. Now, what follows next is you need to add life to this design. And what I mean by that is um, activities of writing uh, software code or instructions that will enable the design to actually start functioning, those activities begin. And um, what happens is the detailed design of the system's component, remember detailed design is the stage we're coming from, so that detailed design of this particular component, for example, of course, they're going to be different components. Now, the detailed design of a system's component should be implementable in a programming language. So you don't want to just have a, a nice looking design, but which is not implementable. So whatever was designed in a detailed form as a component, you should be able to translate that design to code. Okay, and furthermore, there should be testing of a coded component. So when you write a code for a component, you need to test it. Is it working? Okay, and of course, what follows next is you need to integrate all these different components which you are coding. You integrate them. And the reason for that is an individual component may quite all right work well, but is it able to interface with uh, the other component? Is it able to pass data or information successfully? Are they able to work together? So the testing of that is known as integration testing. And the whole idea is to ensure that um, the program exhibits correct behavior, which is acceptable, you know, uh, for what was initially defined as a requirement for the system. Now, uh, having done these activities, uh, you move on to the next activity, which is quite very important, and this is known as acceptance testing. Now, remember, we're looking at the waterfall model, and this used to be the traditional model, you know, in the um, in the early years, you know, of uh, this information systems development uh, uh, discipline. So you have all these stages which were defined, you know, for the purpose of having an orderly way to the way uh, software has to be developed. And one important component which was added was uh, acceptance testing. And what this means is uh, the system has to be tested uh, by the users for them to accept, you know, that yes, this is what uh, we need it. So you need to perform some acceptance testing with the customers to ensure that the system meets the requirements. And it is only after acceptance of the integrated system that the product is finally released to the customer. And what follows after uh, testing activities is maintenance. Now you need to know that maintenance, this is something that continues throughout, you know, the life of uh, the system because you want to continue observing the system. Is it still working according to uh, the way we want it? Is it meeting um, uh, current demands? Does it need an upgrade? Is there a new component we can add? So the thing is, after product release, all work on the system is considered under the category of maintenance. Until such time as a new version of the product demands a total redesign or the product is phased out entirely. So maintenance continues as long as you feel this is still usable, okay, we can remove some errors, we can update a little thing here and there. And so what this means is the majority of the lifetime of a product is actually spent in the maintenance activity. So maintenance goes on until well, you feel, well, you know what, let us get rid of this thing or we just need a new thing or let us do a total redesign. And uh, maintenance involves, like I've just mentioned, correction of errors. You know, it can involve debugging or some simple revision of certain things. Okay, and maintenance provides feedback to all of the other activities in the life cycle. So as you go on maintaining the system, 
it also gives you an opportunity to see um, what needed to be done maybe at a certain stage of the SDLC and that is why here in this illustration we're showing operation and maintenance it acts as feedback where you know you have an opportunity to go back to requirements analysis how was this requirement specified uh, can we update it um, um, how can we uh, remove this error and maintenance again may lead you to look into something which um, had been put in the architectural specification and so on and so forth so um, that's about that now let, let us move on to uh, validation and uh, verification I, I need to point out here that the design must be checked to ensure that it both satisfies the high level requirements when I say high level requirements I mean what do you agreed with your client your customers what they wanted you know in the system so you you, you want to ensure that um, what we're doing here is valid valid in terms of this is what is needed what is specified in the requirement specification and of course you also need to check if what has been specified as requirements is also complete and is consistent um, with you know the internal structure of the system how it actually needs to implement those things in terms of code you know in terms of its internal design so essentially what you have is uh, validation and verification and in short validation is concerned with designing the right product what the customer specified and verification is concerned about designing the product right to make sure that all the internal structure components are able to work with each other uh, correctly now uh, that is all that goes on in the waterfall model you know it starts all the way from the time you elicit requirements you move on through design and then you code, you test, and well, you start carrying out maintenance activities. Now, when you look at it that way, it may seem uh, pretty simple that things have to move uh, sequentially from one stage to the other. But in real, uh, real world situations, uh, it really doesn't happen like that. And so the waterfall model, uh, although we still talk about it, it, it has really just... Uh, remain as something we can refer to but um, you need to know what exactly had prompted such um, you know a methodology so if this is when you're listening to this lecture please play the last presentation for you to know where we are coming from and what I need to mention at this point is traditional software engineering life cycle you know it arose out of a need that was in the 60s and 70s there was a need to provide structure you know to the development of large software systems remember there was a software crisis where uh, it was pointed out that uh, things are getting done in a haphazard way and so there was an attempt to introduce you know the approach of engineering when developing software okay and so there was need to have some sort of a structure to activities that are involved in developing software but the other thing you need to know is uh, uh, a majority of systems, uh, information systems or software projects, which characterize the software crisis era, these were uh, large data processing applications in business, and they were batch processing systems. And what that should bring to your mind is batch processing systems have very little or no, well, not really no, uh, interactivity but uh, they hardly have what you can call interactivity compared to uh, modern systems today okay a batch processing system gives you time to collect data first and then you input it at a certain point and once processing starts uh, you leave the system like that until it is done with what it is doing so there is no uh, real-time interaction there is really no interactivity and now these are systems for which a model like waterfall model was developed for so the applications were not highly interactive okay they were batch processing systems and hence when you talk about issues of usability in that era of time those were not really an issue of concern you wouldn't talk about um, issues of usability how easy is the system to use and all that well it wasn't really necessary but then uh with the advent of the personal computer 
you know, in the 1970s, in the 1980s, and with their commercial success and wide uh, uh, usage, you know, there was uh, a growing need for personal computers. And what that meant is a computer is no longer just some big machinery equipment which is used at a certain organization with a very few uh, specialists who know how to go about it. Computers now became a thing of use, you know, by individuals. You know, you, you had a desktop. Uh, later on, we had uh, uh, laptops and all that. And so what that means is if you're going to make a, a system which is used by everyone, then usability issues come into play, you know, where you want to make sure that um, they're user friendly, people won't have problems, one doesn't have to have all the technical knowledge in order for them to interact with the computer system. So now what this brings us to is that the system's development life cycle, which we described earlier, um, you know, it presents the process of design in sequential order. But actual design process, you know, even for the very batch processing systems, it is iterative, you know. At a certain point, you get to realize, oh, I think we needed to add this. Oh, let us go back to requirements analysis. We, we, we check how we can accommodate this change and all that. Now, with a growing need for usability issues um, and giving attention to that, you notice that the traditional waterfall model wasn't uh, very helpful in that, okay? And um, if we were to use the waterfall model to actually show what happens in reality, it would look something like this, okay? Whereas the traditional model requires that when you move from one stage, before you can move on to the next, you need to make sure that all the work which needed to be done during requirement solicitation was complete, done, done, signed off, and then you move on to the next stage, architectural design, and the assumption is every work has been done perfectly. But then in a real world situation, it's, it's not like that. Even at the time, uh, by the time you do your integration testing, you may see certain issues arising. And so you are forced to go back to implement uh, implementation and unit testing. I, again, that to, uh, require you to go back to detailed design to make sure that whatever changes you want to make here they communicate or are consistent with what was done in detailed design and so this is what you see okay and um this is some sort of representation of how iteration would happen in a waterfall model and so clearly the systems development life cycle the traditional one clearly has limitations Okay, so, and what are these things we are talking about? The waterfall model suits a sequential approach to design. That is, um, it assumes that you really know what you need to do from the beginning. And usually it is in such situations that you can use a waterfall model. A waterfall model is very much applicable in situations where it is clearly known from the beginning what exactly the system needs to do. Okay, so you, 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 you know what are the objectives, what are the goals, and um, if that's the situation, well, then we can structure our approach to design in order to attain whatever goals we want to achieve. But in practice, like we say, designers don't find out all of the requirements for a system before they begin. You know, it seldom happens that way, that you know uh, everything that is needed before you start developing the system. So if you look at uh, the, 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 the illustration I'm from showing you, uh, this one here, it simply shows that during requirement specification, we don't know everything. That's really what it means. Okay, so all of the requirements, especially for an interactive system, cannot be determined, you know, from the from the start, because there are certain issues you can only get to know as a user actually interacts with the system, and then well, you can say, oh, here I think we need it to work like that. Okay, so it is not just possible for you to to know and define all the requirements accurately from the word go before you do anything and uh, when you look at the psychology sociology and human cognition models uh, which may help to try to predict you know when you're using a model a model is something that helps you predict something it helps you predict predict a pattern it may help you predict what may happen if we take this route now, whereas that is very easy when you're dealing with quantifiable things, but when you're developing an information system, although we have psychology models, sociology models, human cognition models, even in human computer interaction, um, well, many decades ago, well, even, well, today, 
significant progress has been made, but you need to know that most psychology, sociology, and human cognition models are incomplete, and they do not allow us to predict how exactly to design something for maximum usability, how users can really, you know, uh, get to uh, find something to be very useful. But I must say, significant progress has been made in this. And research has been going on for some time, you know, on models of human users that can allow prediction, you know, of uh, the performance of the users, you know, with uh, interactive systems and uh, uh, something which can make these systems very easy to use and all that. But it was pointed out that uh, these models, they rely uh, on too much detail of the system to be useful at very early and abstract stages of design, you know, so they rely very much on the stage when you're just doing uh, abstract design or, you know, they only apply to goal-oriented planned activity and not highly interactive uh, WIMP uh, uh, systems. Again, I need to mention that um, the third edition of the textbook you are using uh, was written well, some time back, but they, there's uh, um, interesting progress which has been made and this will be a subject of a certain assignment that I'll be giving out. But well, the thing is, uh, it was observed that there is a lack of predictive psychological theory. Okay, and that meant in order to test certain usability properties of the designs, designers must observe how actual users interact. Now, the purpose of a model is for you to do away with certain costs, with certain uh, wastage of time, which comes with observing an actual thing. Because with a model, it will help you predict, you know, certain things. But now, because of the gaps in uh, uh, predictive, predictive psychology theory as we can use it or adapt it in HCI, you find that designers must observe how actual users interact with a, develop, a developed product. And from there you can measure performance, you know, and well, that is still quite an issue. And in order for the observation results to be worthwhile, the experiments must be as close to a real interaction situation as possible. Now that's the thing, okay? You, you can make some progress uh, in predictive psychological uh, theory, but the nature of information systems still require, um, because of this limitation in trying to accurately predict uh, human behavior in their interaction with computer systems, uh, what that means is for the ob observation results to be worthwhile, the experiments must be as close to a real interaction situation as possible. And again, that means the experimental system must be very much like it would be in the final product whose requirements the designer is trying to establish. Now, John Carroll, a distinguished professor of information sciences and technology, has pointed out the very detail of the actual system. Uh, uh, he's pointed out that the very detail of the actual system can crucially affect its you know, usability. So um, it, it is not worthwhile to experiment on crude estimates of it, you know, where you just have an estimation, it's okay, this is how the design will be, but you don't really have um, data or information on how an actual thing, you know, what kind of results it would produce. So um, he continues to say as that will provide observations whose conclusions will not necessarily apply to the real system. And you know what that leads us to? It leads us to usability engineering and that's the next thing I want us to talk about. We look at usability engineering, what issues are involved in that and uh, we'll talk more about uh, what Carol said. Okay, this is what we have in this lecture.